y'all. It is Alana Bree, and I am so excited to be here this Thursday evening um, to launch uh, T4, which is Tots to Teens Tidbits. And if you like alliterations, I just added this in Teaching Thursdays. So that's a lot of teas. Um, so Tots to Teens Tidbits, we are going to be doing these sessions every Thursday night at 5 p.m. And I'm so excited to be here and able um, to share teaching. We already have a great speaker lined up for next week, Dr. Joseph Lamb, um, and he's going to have a really great lecture. So I encourage you to tune into that. Um, but tonight I am going to be your host and also your lecturer. All right, so next slide, Ooh, wow, technology, um, no buts about it. We're going to talk about diaper dermatitis tonight. Um, and I will tell you that when I decided to do pediatric dermatology way back in 2000, um, my mentor said, what are you doing? Pediatric dermatology, what is that? And I will tell you, it is not all it's cracked up to be. So again, um, diaper area pictures are a common thing um, in pediatric dermatology. It's part of the reason that I do not um, allow people to text me pictures because then they upload to the cloud. Um, and also, I've also learned you should not be doing a diaper dermatitis talk on an airplane. <laughs> because it may arouse some suspicion around you. But all that to be said, it is something that we commonly, commonly see in pediatric dermatology. Um, and these um, diaper rashes are all very different, um, as you can see, and we're gonna talk a little bit about each one of them. But moving forward here to the next slide which I think it's gonna go. We might be doing this lecture out of order. At least we have the pictures up here. Okay, perfect. So why is pediatric dermatology important to Sages? Well, I will tell you why. I know inquiring minds want to know. So it is because Sages is at the forefront. They are at the forefront of almost everything that they do and I am proud to be involved with them. Um, and the Sages is not only committed to patients receiving accurate diagnoses and they're committed to their clients um, and taking good care of them, but they're also committed to education. And I will have to say, I am standing on the shoulders of Dr. Davis and what he's built with the DermPath Happy Hour. Um, and as you can see, that has expanded since he started that several years ago. Um, and education really is part of the DNA at Sages. So it's not just dermatopathology, it's career development, practical pearls, pediatric dermatology. Now we also have some collaborations with surgical dermatology and medical dermatology. Um, so lots of great stuff happening at Sages always. So how did I get here as one of 423 board certified pediatric dermatologists? Well, I will tell you success is not usually what people think it looks like, that straight line. And I'm sure you know, we have people of kind of all different varying stages um, that may be watching this. And I will tell you, that's what I used to think when I applied to medical school and got in that my path was going to be quite linear. Um, and I will tell you that it looks a lot more like the picture on the right. Um, and that's what I think it really looks like for all of us. But for people that are type A, that can be a little disconcerting when you realize that's going to be your path to success. So Initially, I decided I wanted to do dermatology in the very last week of my third year, so I was not an ideal applicant. I hadn't um, done all the things necessary to really make myself a great applicant because I was busy having two kids in med school with my husband, who was a student in my same class, um, and I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, so I had to do a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. I did match, luckily. Um, my first year of applying in a couples match, which um, was remarkable considering I had taken a year off. My husband had also taken a year off. We alternated years off to be at home with our kiddos when we were, they were little. Um, 
So got into dermatology in the same city as my hubs. And I only got three um, interviews, which they say you have to have so many. So take heart for all of those that may be applying to dermatology. I only got three interviews, one at my home institution, one at the location where I matched. And then the other one was just a pity interview because my husband got interviewed. And they even told me that that would be an uphill climb for me at their institution. Um, but despite that, I finished well um, my pediatric dermatology resident, my dermatology residency, and then we were in St. Louis, so there was no formal pediatric dermatology fellowship at the time. So I had to fly back and forth um, to Chicago Northwestern to train there with the great pediatric dermatology um, mentors I had there. Then I became the director of pediatric dermatology at St. Louis University and started up the program in Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. Then my husband decided he wanted to do fellowship in Texas. So here we come to Texas. Um, and I had a, a great academic career at Texas Children's. I was an author, a lecturer, a researcher. I got an NIH grant. I actually, one of the most fun things I got to do was be on a World Health Organization committee. But then I got burned out, like crispy fried burned out. Um, I did some mission work. Um, and how I landed in this dream job is because of Dr. John Cangelosi and just his forward thinkingness um, and all that he does, but um, started as the director of pediatric dermatology collaboration this year. And I have to say, I'm just thrilled because of that. I love to teach. I love to mentor. Um, and that's really what this role is all about. I've also been able to uh, be an advisor and speaker for Serebii as well. And then my kind of heart and soul, aside from my position with Sages, is the nonprofit that I found, founded made a masterpiece. And you guys will have to check that out. But I am proud to say that Sages um, is our official sponsor of Made a Masterpiece. And, and with John, um, we've received nearly $100,000 from Sages over the years. So um, they really put their money where their mouth is. Um, and again, I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this and to be launching this teaching with y'all tonight. So I was just gonna start a little bit about the history of pediatric dermatology. And hopefully some of you who are listening are interested in becoming a pediatric dermatologist um, and joining the other 423 of us in the United States. Um, they actually had the first international symposium in 1972 where the International Society of Pediderm was founded. Then the Society of Pediatric Dermatology was founded the next year in 1973 here in the US by some really great mentors, um, physicians, um, and people really um, that began that. Um, and some of their names may look familiar because they're on a lot of the pediatric and neonatal dermatology textbooks. And then the first issue of our journal, Pediatric Dermatology, was first published in 1982. We became recognized by the ACGME in 2000, who now oversees the fellowship um, approval process. The first subspecialty certification exam was given through the American Board of Dermatology in 2004, and I sat for the second one. Um, and it is a growing field. It's really exciting. Um, I will tell you the the lasers have now expanded into um, pediatric dermatology surgery, um, which is really um, amazing and incredible. Lots of good um, mentors, then expansion in research to the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance, which is a great um, supportive collaborative group um, as far as advancing pediatric dermatology um, knowledge. And now there's 39 fellowship programs in the US as of 2022. And before we launch into this, I just want to express my gratitude for two of my mentors. And for anybody listening, I would go out and find a mentor that you love and that loves you back um, because they will kind of be your lifeblood throughout your career. Um, and Dr. Lane Siegfried was my first mentor um, at St. Louis University where I did fellowship. And then Dr. Annette Wagner um, was my mentor during my fellowship time at Northwestern. And Again, such a, a debt of gratitude to both of them and everything that I share, um, I really have learned first from them. So back to diaper dermatitis, why we're here. And again, these little lectures are gonna be little tidbits, little bite-sized nuggets of knowledge. Um, and so they'll last only about 15 to 30 minutes. 
Um, and again, sometimes I will be the lecturer, but we are um, expanding our guest lecture panel. And so we'll have lots of great um, lectures over time about all kinds of clinical areas of dermatopathology. And then Dr. Davis and I at some point are gonna do some collaborations with the pathology and the clinical pictures for um, some CPCs. So just so many exciting things to come. But again, if you're a pediatric dermatologist, you have to know diaper dermatitis. And if you're a general dermatologist, you have to know diaper dermatologist. And basically, if you have family or friends, you need to know diaper dermatitis because your friends are going to have babies and then they're going to ask you about their kids' diaper dermatitis. So this is a classic picture of irritant contact dermatitis. Um, this can also be an allergic contact dermatitis, but typically um, it is related to just irritant dermatitis. And you can always tell this, it's usually very well demarcated, just like you see here in this picture. Um, it usually is bright red um, just because of the irritation potential. Um, and like I tell my families, um, what's irritating continues to happen in the diaper area. It's also very common with what some people call drool dermatitis because babies drool a lot. Um, I treat them actually very similarly, but irritant contact dermatitis, again, is always gonna have that bright red color. Um, and then it's going to have that well demarcation. And it tends to avoid the con the, the creases because what is irritating usually is not in the creases. So you shouldn't have them um, in the folds of the skin. It'll be more on the contact surfaces um, where irritants may be touching the skin. Um, sometimes it can just be irritation from what happens in the diaper area. So pee and poop um, is very irritating to the skin, especially if you have a kiddo with very sensitive skin. And then the diaper area is exposed to so many things in kids um, and it's very sensitive skin. Um, so a lot of times it's just irritation from the diaper. And I will tell you that most diapers, the now disposable diapers tend to be more absorptive. Um, and they actually cause less irritant diaper dermatitis. I do find that when um, parents use cloth diapers, um, they do tend to get a lot more irritant derma dermatitis just because the, the diaper, the cloth diaper doesn't wick um, the fluids and the moisture away from the skin and the urine sits on the skin. Um, and then stool can also sit on the skin and cause a lot of irritation. So I do like the super absorptive diapers. There are some that have less um, fragrances um, and irritants in them, um, but all in all, they are gonna have some irritation. And when kiddos transition to the pull-ups, um, that is a time when irritant dermatitis comes out significantly because those diapers have way more fragrance in them because kids are bigger and are smellier when they go to the bathroom. Um, so they have more fragrance in them. They also have more dye because they try to make those pull-ups look like underwear for the kids. Um, and the dye can be really irritating or even cause an allergic contact dermatitis. Um, and as far as treating irritant contact dermatitis, basically it is hard to clear. And I think it's important um, in, in pediatric dermatology, we talk a lot about anticipatory guidance. And what that means is you're just really giving the parents expectations of what they can look for in the future, what they can expect, what they should be worried about. So irritant contact dermatitis, um, because what's going to be what is irritating keeps happening. They're gonna to continue to you know, go to the bathroom and continue to wear a diaper for a while. Same thing with the drool dermatitis. They're gonna to continue to drool and need to be dried off. So um, what I recommend for irritant dermatitis is basically using very gentle skincare products. Um, and I do use no fragrance products. Vanny Cream has some great products out there, CeraVe. Um, and again, I do speak for CeraVe, but I do think those are the products that have the least amount of irritants. If you have a very sensitive baby, I think Vanny Cream um, is actually an excellent option. Um, and I recommend that people um, don't use diaper wipes at all. Um, there are water wipes out there. They do have grapefruit extracts. So you can imagine if you have irritated skin, even a little bit of grapefruit would be acidic and could burn the skin um, that's already irritated. Um, 
So I do recommend that families make their own diaper wipes. And basically you can use um, a bounty paper towel roll and cut it in half and put it in a cup, of half, a cup and a half of just plain water with a little squirt of mineral oil in it, mix it up and put that roll of toilet, the, the roll of bounty paper towels in there. Um, and those are the ones that are the least irritating. Um, and they actually stand up to being in that little tub. And then you pull the core out, it gets wet, you pull the core out, and then you can pull little wipes out of there. Um, and then they can throw those in a baggie, just pull out a few if they're gonna be out and about. Um, they're also great to use for the face. So again, um, all of the commercially available uh, diaper wipes are not great. Um, there's not one on the market that I like actually. Um, the other thing is people can use just plain cloths you know, little small uh, baby cloths that they can just use one time and, and clean themselves. Um, the other thing that is also helpful if you have a baby that's very sensitive, you can take a little bit of mineral oil on cotton balls or on uh, makeup squares, cotton makeup squares, and just tap the area and not even actually wipe. Um, and then I do recommend babies with irritated skin to have an ointment applied after every diaper after every diaper change, regardless of if they have the rash or not. And I recommend if I see a newborn that they just start doing a barrier ointment. Um, and again, Vanny cream ointment or the CeraVe healing ointment are both great choices. Plain old Vaseline petroleum jelly. Those are the three things that I recommend, one of those three things. So that we're exposing the area to less irritants. Um, Cause again, what's happening in the diaper area is already irritating and put a good thick smear of that on every surface um, before you put on the diaper. We don't like powders in the diaper area. They're very irritating. They can become like sand when they get wet. So no powders in the area. Um, and then most of the commercially available uh, Diaper creams have other things that we don't like in them, like lanolin or fragrance or balsam of Peru, um, which is technically a fragrance. So again, none of the commercially available diaper pastes are very good. Um, and then the only other product that I'll sometimes recommend is just plain zinc oxide ointment, but zinc oxide 100% would be a brick. So basically they have to put it in other things to make it um, able to be applied. So you really do have to look at some zinc oxides. Sometimes some of the zinc oxides will have lanolin in them. Um, and there are ones out there that just have like mineral oil or beeswax added to them. Um, and those are the ones. So you just have to make sure that um, the family shows you the zinc oxide. But I think that the plain clear ointments do just as well as the zinc oxide. Um, and it's less messy. So the families tend to like either Vaseline, the CeraVe healing ointment or the Vanny cream ointment. Um, also, you need to caution them that these things, it's best to get them out of a tube because when they come in a tub, if they're putting their hand in the tub, smeared on, on their baby's bottom and then putting their hand back in the tub, they've basically made their ointment a big fat Petri dish. So um, that's also another thing. So, and then I continue to have them wear the diapers. I don't have them do any periods of drying or anything like that. Um, and then just make sure that they're doing good diaper products. And again, um, and I mean, skincare um, with their kiddos, with gentle cleansers. Um, and I do recommend bathing every day um, for these kiddos. So that's irritant diaper dermatitis. It's by far the most common. So we're gonna spend the most time on it. Um, and then this next one, um, it's a severe case of this, um, and it is something that very commonly happens in babies. It's seborrheic dermatitis. I also call seborrheic dermatitis because a lot of people, when they look at seborrheic dermatitis, they see adults with seborrheic dermatitis just on the face or in the nasomelial folds. Um, and diaper, the seborrheic dermatitis that affects infants and affects the diaper area is a little bit different um, than kind of the classic seborrheic dermatitis that we think of in adults. So in babies, um, it does tend to involve the scalp. So, you know, the, the classic cradle cap, but it loves folds. It loves the neck. So a lot of people you know, diagnose these kids um, as having yeast in their neck folds when all it is is just seborrheic dermatitis. Um, so again, if I see a baby that has cradle cap, I always look behind their ears. That's another place that likes to hang out in their neck and their axillary areas and in their inguinal folds and diaper area, as well as any little skin creases and their fat rolls on their arms and legs. Um, 
and this is a severe case of seborrheic dermatitis, you can have full body seborrheic dermatitis. And when you do, you tend to have significant involvement in the diaper area. Um, and for this, um, we again want to do gentle skincare. So those same products that we use for irritant skincare, um, I do like the babies to be bathed every day just because it puts moisture back in the skin, gets the things that irritate off the skin. And we know any inflamed skin is at risk for a secondary infection. So it also decreases the colonization on the skin. Um, as far as treating this area, again, same thing, no irritating diaper wipes. Um, and then doing a barrier ointment with every diaper change, again, Vaseline, CeraVe healing ointment or Vanny cream ointment with every single diaper change. And when a baby is this inflamed, they are so uncomfortable. And I do recommend doing topical steroids. Now, topical steroids in babies um, can be a big issue um, because they do have a bigger body surface area and the diaper area is under occlusion. So that does increase the potential absorption. And I have seen babies that have, you know, gotten too much topical steroids, toddlers actually, I've never seen a baby um, get this. Um, but with other, other children that I've treated that have seen dermatologists who prescribe triamcinolone in a tub, these families use that as a moisturizer. And that's the only time I've ever seen HPA axis suppression is from people that were using those, um, those tubs of triamcinolone ointment um, kind of as their moisturizer head to toe. And we're getting them prescribed by not just the, the dermatologist, but also the pediatrician and maybe the allergist and the pulmonologist they were going for for their wheezing. So they would go through a lot more than what you realize sometimes. So again, I always try to, use the lowest potency that works, but in kids, sometimes you have to go higher um, to actually get this to calm down and then you can back off. So in my opinion, it's better to hit things hard, um, get things improved, and then it's easier to keep them maintained with good skincare. Because I think a lot of times people start low when they see a bad diaper dermatitis, and then they have to keep ratcheting it up and then people will get nervous, your patients will get nervous, their families will get nervous that um, they have steroid resistance and you have to keep going up. So it's better to hit hard for short term, monitor it closely. So for this, I would probably go with a mid potency ointment um, initially for even up to five days um, and then see them back because again, new parents um, need a lot of hand holding as well. So I do a short follow up window, um, see that they're getting better and then we'll step down to you know the lowest potency topical steroid prescription. I do use a lot of flucinolone oil um, because I think it is the closest to our skin barrier. Our skin's a lipid, it's a lipid. Um, and the main reason I like it in children and babies is it doesn't really burn. Um, and anytime you put on a topical steroid that burns, um, the families have, you know, a decreased risk or decreased use of it. So the compliance goes way down. So again, get this under control as quick as you can, and then just keep it going with good skincare. And then here, this is um, a classic picture of yeasty beasties. So you can see the satellite papules and pustules um, here. Um, and they tend to be in these areas where it tends to be irritated initially. Um, and then the yeast will come up as a secondary um, finding. And for this, you can use topical. I do tend to like the ointments, the antifungal ointments. Very rarely um, do you have to do orals, but if it is extensive, I will do a short course um, of oral nystatin um, to help clear this up, but that's rare to have to go to that. But topical antifungals can be a little bit irritating. Um, and so I tend to, um, again, treat for the shortest amount of time. And sometimes I'll even combine the topical antifungal with a squirt of the ointment for that. And then a squirt of the topical steroid, the antifungal and the topical steroid mix one-to-one -one on the fingertip and then apply it if we are having a lot of irritation at the same time, because you're kind of treating it two pronged. I never like giving the combination treatments that have both in one tube, even though it's convenient. Um, it lets, um, it makes them sometimes use antifungals when they don't need them and sometimes use topical steroids when they don't need them. So it's better to, um, to tailor the care to exactly what's going on at the time. And that's gonna change over time in the diaper area as well. This next picture um, is a good example of this in the diaper area. 
the bright red, well demarcated scaly plaques, a papulosquamous eruption clearly. Um, and you can tell it's kind of got that yellow scale. Um, it's involving the umbilicus. It's also involving the skin creases, which is very common in this condition. So this is uh, psoriasis in the diaper area. And they tend to also have involvement on their scalp um, in, in the skin folds as well, kind of like subarachnoid dermatitis. Um, but the difference here is um, the difference between subderm and psoriasis is really um, the well demarcated um, pattern of it um, and the other areas of involvement and the scale tends to be thicker in psoriasis. Um, so those are kind of the differentiating features. Um, the reason that's important is sometimes more the anticipatory guidance, like what does, you know, it's not going to change much of your management. I treat both subarachnoid dermatitis and psoriasis in the diaper area very much the same or exactly the same really. Um, but the difference is just the anticipatory guidance of what they can expect in the future. Um, so diaper area psoriasis, the next two are very uncommon. This was a patient um, that one of my fellow residents saw when we were in residency um, and thought that this was, um, a, you know, had the scale was very um, exfoliative. Um, and the resident that saw the patient first in the ER thought that this might be a positive Nikolsky um, and said that the child had Steven Johnson syndrome because the baby had been sick and um, had some fevers and been on, you know, antipyretics. So I think had been on some Tylenol and ibuprofen plus different antibiotics. Um, and this is a classic board question, um, a picture like this, but this can be the presenting sign of Kawasaki's disease. Um, so very different from Steven Johnson syndrome or, you know, TEN. And um, in, if you're in your differential, you might think of staph scalded skin, but they're going to have the perioral furrowing and scale there as well. Um, and this baby also had kind of like a hive like eruption in other areas. Um, so again, this can be a board question. Um, and they'll show you this picture and say, what can this be a presenting sign of? And again, Kawasaki's, um, which we'll have a lecture about that at some point in the future. And then this last one that we're going to go over, um, the petechiae here are what give this away. So this is histiocytosis. Um, this does like to be in subareic areas, if you will. So in the diaper area, the skin folds tends to be, again, on the scalp, behind the ears. Um, and these babies will have more of this petechial eruption, which you can see kind of throughout the abdomen. Um, so non-blanching papules within the background of erythema. Um, and really the other inflammatory um, dermatitis, diaper dermatitis, um, you don't see this petechiae. So if you see an inflammatory eruption um, in a subarachnoid distribution with petechiae, you should really be thinking about histiocytosis and getting a workup and, and referrals um, so that the, the baby can be evaluated for that further with your colleagues. So um, that ends this exciting first talk on diaper dermatitis, no buts about it. Um, and I will tell you, I am so excited to be doing this with you every Thursday. Um, and I'm just looking forward to lots of good PD Derm teaching. For now, I will sign off and I hope you guys all have a good night.